Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to uh, be invited here by Pastor Ray to join you in sharing in the Word. And um, I first met Ray uh, when he first uh, came here to be with you in, uh, was it 2018? So uh, a few years ago, and we were a part of a pastoral prayer group together uh, that met every Friday morning. And so I got to know Ray uh, through that. Um, I am a Connecticut native. I... Um, uh, I've been in ministry and volunteer and in paid ministry in some sense for close to 30 years um, since I've been about, um, you know, a baby, I guess. Um, I'm actually a little older than that, but um, I live here in Bloomfield, uh, Bloomfield with my wife and my four kids. Um, I was the associate pastor at Pequannock Community Church in Windsor from 2014 to 2019. And, uh, and during that time, I was also, some of you may be familiar with Urban Alliance in Hartford. I also worked there as well. And, uh, but in 2019, my family uh, received uh, an offer to uh, go up to Lakeside Christian Camp in the Berkshires of Massachusetts and, and uh, take a position as their ministry and program director. Uh, sadly, in March of 2020, something a little bit uh, crazy happened that you probably all know about March of 2020, and uh, the uh, owners of the camp decided that they did not want to uh, continue the camp uh, and weather out COVID, and so they shut the camp down permanently. I had moved my family up there from Windsor, where we were living at the time, to the Berkshires, and so then where we were in the Berkshires, uh, had no job, and our house was at the camp. And uh, so it, it was um, a little bit of a precarious time, uh, but also I've learned to see it as a blessing because uh, while many people were sort of locked down to their house, my kids, uh, from, who were all you know, teens and young children, got to enjoy 130 acres in the Berkshires on an empty summer camp. So uh, that wasn't too bad. Um, so seeing that, I wanted to give my kids some stability. Stability. We moved back to this area, and I now work for the Ethel Walker School in Simsbury in technology. I know it's, a, it's kind of a shift from where I was ministry-wise, um, but it was, it was in my toolbox. And, uh, and so now I, um, I love to serve the Lord by um, uh, uh, speaking on occasionally at different churches, and, uh, and I'm just enjoying being here with you today. So my path took a little bit of a twist and turn, but as I heard someone say once uh, that uh, I guess God just wanted, in, enjoys to give you the scenic route sometimes, not necessarily the way you thought it would be. Um, I'm going to be preaching from John 19, uh, the Gospel of John chapter 19, verses 17 through 30. Uh, I guess the... Uh, the words will be on the screen. You can turn in your pew Bible. It's uh, page 1051. I am going to be using the ESV throughout my message. And um, your pew Bibles are NIV. little similarity, some difference. But I think uh, uh, we'll all straighten it out in the end. So hear these words from the Gospel of John. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on, other si on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write king of the, the king of the Jews, but it rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. Also this, his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. And so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. 
And so the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and his disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. And after this, Jesus, knowing all that was now finished, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for what you have done for us in, in your life, but also in your death. And I thank you for this testimony of John and all the gospels that it recount what you have done. And Lord, I just thank you for this message, God, that you have uh, given to me to share this, this morning. I pray that you open hearts to receive it, Lord. And may the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So a few weeks ago, uh, my youngest son, who's nine, he, uh, he came to me with a question. He asked me, and seeing that we're in the Lent season and Good Friday is going to be upon us real soon. So he asked me this question. He says, why do they call it Good Friday? To which I told my son, I said, well, that's because that's the day we remember Jesus' death. And then he said to me, he goes, that's sad. Jesus died. That, that's sad. Now, I will refrain from how I responded to that until the end of my message, but I know you're probably all, you know, uh, sitting on the edge of your pews uh, wondering what I said, but I'll get there. But in the gospel reading I just read, we read about Jesus' death. And as followers of Christ, I mean, we hear about Jesus' death all the time. We sang it this morning. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, if you know it, reminds us that Jesus suffered, died, and was buried. I mean, we have a symbol of his death, you know, here to look at, here and, and up there. You, you tune into Christian radio, um, you play a worship song on your device of choice, and you're going to sing about Jesus' death. And, it, and it'll be celebrated. I mean, it's just common language for Christians. However, it's also really important to remember that the means by which Jesus died is, was not celebrated and sung at that time. It was an ancient Roman torture device for execution. In Palestine 2,000 years ago, the cross was not dignified as it is today. It was not wore around your neck. It was not displayed. It was, a, it was for many to be publicly shamed and died and tortured. So horrific was this torture that actually, the, uh, if you were a Roman citizen, no matter how horrible your crime was, it was uh, you were not to be executed this way because it was considered indignant. So the cross is terrible. It wasn't a symbol. It was torture. And while today, even those who do not follow Christ, they see this as a religious symbol. You show anybody who, uh, the furthest removed from being a Christian, you show them this, and they'll say, oh, that's a religious symbol. But the meaning of the cross is not religious. It was a guillotine. It was a gallows. It was an electric chair. 
And even in our modern context, despite it being a powerful symbol, the death of Christ is actually still a mystery. I mean, if you see Jesus as a hero worth worshiping, as we just did this morning, then you have to ask the question, why did he die like this? How can a hero die so embarrassingly, so cruelly, so shamefully? I mean, strong leaders fight, right? Heroes, they defeat the enemy, not bow down to them. I mean, isn't that what every good movie tells us, right? For many, the cross of Christ, philosophically speaking anyway, is, it, it's just absurd. It makes no sense. Why would he die like that? I mean, maybe it would make more sense if, like, Jesus uh, died in battle, right? You know? Or maybe it would make more sense if Jesus died when um, he was trying to save somebody, I don't know, who was captured by the enemy. Or maybe it would make more sense if Jesus died uh, while he, w- he got sick while trying to heal the many who were sick. You know, he was healing somebody and he caught something and he died. It was virtuous. Maybe it would have made more sense if Jesus died in a passionate attack while he was um, preaching. But no, that's not how Jesus died. Jesus was pursued by religious leaders. He was betrayed by a disciple. He was tried and found innocent by a Roman official. He was traded for death with a political dissident named Barabbas. He willingly submitted to torture and shame on a cross. And then he was placed hanging on a cross next to two criminals on a garbage heap. That's what it was. So... Taking all that into account, Jesus was the antithesis of everything we typically value as a hero in our culture. Jesus was no John Wayne. So the question remains, why? I mean, why did the God of the universe who breathed the stars into existence choose to die in this way? Today, I mean, you can find all kinds of answers to that question. You can find theories, you can find theologies, you can find books upon books who answer that question. However, the why, as with many things in life, is not as straightforward as we might think. There's this quote from this uh, author that I really enjoy. Uh, his name is Sky Dutani, and he put it this way, if you listen. But it's important to realize, unlike the nature of the Trinity or Jesus, no church council was ever convened to clarify the nature of the cross. No creed was written to determine which single understanding of the cross is orthodox. That's because scripture does not affirm just one, like a gem whose facets reflect light differently as it turns, Our vision of the cross changes as we see it from different angles recorded in scripture with no single perspective negating another. That's why when the many facets of the cross are embraced together, that we begin to marvel at the beauty and the mystery of what God has done. So if we're looking at uh, John 19, uh, it's a really hard passage to read. It's hard, I mean, at least for me, I don't know how you feel, because they're torturing my best friend, my Lord. My cousin, uh, he recently asked me my thoughts on the, uh, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ. Do you remember that movie? Um, you know, it spends, if you're not familiar with it, it spends like two hours in historical detail on the death of Jesus. You know, it's often called the passion. And so I told him, I said, he wanted to know my thoughts. And I said, well, you know, it's a very well-made movie, um, but I can't bear to watch it anymore. It's just gut-wrenching to see 
his death, my best friend, my Lord, his death depicted on film. And it's kind of what, it's sort of the opposite of what the gospel portrays in a lot of ways. In the gospel, the gory details are often left out. Instead, it focuses on the cross's implications rather than all the bloodthirsty details. So it, it could also have been that the writers of the gospel, they actually, they were witnesses to Jesus' death. And maybe it was just as horrific for them that they uh, didn't want to bring up those details again. It was gut-wrenching for them, too. So, but in many ways, the story of Jesus' death actually mirrors his life. His death wasn't an interruption to what he was called here to do. Amen? Many churches, I mean, I, they see it this way. They see that the death of Jesus is just an interruption. Good Friday is ignored so they can skip to the, dare I say, happier part of the story. Easter. Resurrection, celebration, not all that sad stuff. Even this songwriter that I know and love, some of you may know him, his name's Andrew Peterson. Uh, he doesn't often shy away from talking about hard, hard topics, but um, he wrote a two volume set on the Easter story, and he called it Resurrection Letters. And he actually wrote volume two in 2008. The Glory of the Resurrection, all in one album, volume two. And then he decided 10 years later to write volume one in 2018 because it was just too hard to write songs about Jesus' death. It's easier to write happy songs, I guess. So the gospel affirms that Jesus' death wasn't an interruption into his booming, successful ministry. But it was the fulfillment of him bringing his kingdom here on earth. Amen? The gospel affirms that Jesus' death wasn't that. Even if you look in, in uh, John 18, uh, when Judas portrayed him, the soldiers uh, came to get him. So if you look at uh, John 18, verses 4 through 5, it says, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus, and, and they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. See, Jesus, he knew this was coming. And if Jesus is good as we declare him to be as followers of Christ then Jesus' death is good. And, when we, and what we see here in the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus is reversing even one of the most terrible means of torture ever devised. If you look at verse 17 in chapter nine, uh, 19, it says, And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. So earlier in Jesus' ministry, he mentions bearing a cross to his disciples. You can see it actually in uh, Matthew chapter 16. It says, If anyone would come after me, let him, de let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. You see, Jesus is showing us in word and in deed the very nature of what it means to bear our cross. So as I mentioned earlier from the quote from Sky Datani, that um, the cross is multifaceted. It means that it means different things. One such meaning for us modern day evangelicals often is to hone on the fact that Jesus died so we don't have to die. 
Or, as some would interpret that, so we don't have to suffer. Well, I think Scripture says otherwise. We do have to die every day to ourselves and to submit to the one we follow. Highlighting this connection between Jesus' own words and his actions shows that there is an aspect of the cross where we must also bear our own cross and suffer. A life in Christ should be marked with bearing of a cross. If you don't believe me, also maybe Paul. Paul in the Philippians, uh, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 11, says this. Not looking to our own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, listen church, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even on a cross. Now does this mean we carry a cross to death, a horrible death, a literal cross? I mean, I know you've probably heard some people actually do this, particularly around, uh, you know, uh, Holy Week, as some refer to it, the week before Easter. They'll actually literally, like, take on a cross, or some will just do it all year. No, no, it means that the Christian life, it isn't easy. And there are things in this life we must die to so that we might live in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen? Verse 18, back in chapter, uh, John chapter 19. So it says there, they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. See, all four Gospels, they actually mention, and, and all four Gospels don't often do this. They don't often uh, mention uh, one singular event. There's only a handful of these. But all four Gospels mention Jesus crucified with two others. But commentators aren't really in agreement of, like, who these two men were. The common idea is that, uh, that these two men were thieves. And um, we... No one actually repented, and Jesus offers salvation to him. Uh, The Gospel of John only mentions him briefly. But some other commentators, they they believe that these two also might have been political figures like Barabbas, who uh, who was guilty of causing an uprising, which makes sense because, you know, Barabbas was supposed to go to his death And Jesus replaced him. But I think the importance lies in that Jesus was placed between them. He was placed in the midst of sinners. He died like a sinner with sinners. And I think it emphasizes the humility of the cross. The cross was also a place of physical torture it was also a place of psychological torture and John knew these things and he chose to really hone in on those details and the place of the crucifixion Golgotha was a garbage heap it was burning and smoking because people would bring their trash there that's where they crucified people Jesus was stripped naked, hanging on a cross for all to see. It was shameful. 
Jesus was placed between two criminals. And in verses 19 and 20, if you look, a sign was placed upon Jesus' head proclaiming him to be the king of the Jews. The sign was, spo- was meant to be humiliating to Jesus. But it was also meant to be humiliating to the, Jew- uh, the, the uh, religious leaders at the time. Pilate thought, uh, you know, was thinking Jesus proclaimed to be king. And yet here he is suffering and being humiliated on the cross. Here's your king. Look, here he is. And the Pharisees were also embarrassed by this sign. But they weren't embarrassed for Jesus. They were embarrassed for themselves. And they wouldn't want people to believe that this is their king. Really? So it's interesting how the Gospel of John tells us that the Pharisees tell Pilate, they say, can you rewrite that, please? Come on. And the Pharisees, they didn't want any ambiguity about who Jesus was. <coughs> it's like they were telling Pilate, you know, it's not who he is, really. Only what he said he, uh, he was. I mean, do you see the difference? Church, it's amazing to me the lengths we will go to to protect our own image and not be represented poorly. You know, particularly in our image, image, social media culture, we have to make sure our self-marketing is on spot so as not to confuse people. And what we do, what, I mean, what would we do if we couldn't edit our social media posts and tweets, right? And this is kind of what's going on here. The Pharisees didn't want their, themselves represented poorly by claiming this guy does not represent us. So far, what we've seen is that Jesus' death represents suffering. It also We've also seen that it represents humility and a call for our humility for those of you who are in Christ. So let's look verses 23 through 24. And so as we continue in this text, it gives us a further picture of this humiliation that Christ endured. So four soldiers, they divided up Jesus' clothing And to really paint you a picture, I mean, it's one thing, we've heard this story before, but to really paint a picture of what's going on here, you have to think about it in maybe a more modern day context. To really, um, so think about it this way. Imagine um, anything more undignifying than to say, you know, children of a dying parent in a hospital room as the parent lays there dying. Imagine they're sitting there arguing over who gets their possessions as the parent lies there unable to speak. It's sick, right? This is what's happening here. And it's happening at the feet of the cross, foot of the cross. But there's also something deeper, I think, that's happening here. Two things, actually. And I think it also reveals the depth of our sin. And the other, I think, reveals the sovereignty of God. First, lately I've come to be more aware over the last few years just how our modern evangelical Christianity is just scourging for power. We... And I, and I say we because I identify as evangelical in many ways. That we're dividing up Jesus' clothes and casting lots to get whatever we want out of Christianity. For our own purposes. Rather than understand and submit to what Jesus is doing right in front of us. The soldiers, they I mean, they had no understanding of what was happening. 
And they only made deals for his clothes at his feet because, I mean, they were doing it because cloth was scarce those days. It was expensive. But I believe that the way forward for the church is to stop trying to get what they want out of Christ rather than whether, I mean, whatever it is, whether it's a justification for political beliefs, healing the good life, a feel-good teaching, Jesus doesn't offer stuff for us. He asks us to follow him. But the deeper, I think, but deeper than that and deeper than the callousness of these soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothes was what the Gospel of John says, why it took place. Look at this. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. This is a quote from Psalm 22, 18. Should be, yeah, right there. We don't know whatever happened to Jesus' clothes. I mean, I suspect Jesus' clothes would probably make a great Indiana Jones movie someday. I mean, Indiana Jones and the Lost Tunic. You know, maybe I should copyright that. What do you think? But what's happening here is it was that that moment was ordained by God. It happened. It happened to prove that he was the Messiah. He was the Christ. He was the king of the Jews. He was the God of the universe. It shows us a prophecy fulfilled in Psalm 22. And there may be, church, there may be things, decisions that you have regret. There may be terrible things that you've done. Evil things that have happened to you. But God will redeem it. Amen? Believe it. I'm not saying God made it happen, but his power working through you and this situation can prove he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he is your Lord. At the cross is suffering, humility, and God's sovereignty. Suffering, humility, and God's sovereignty. Are you standing at the cross of Christ? Can you see it? Are you following him close enough to see the work of God's goodness even when it feels sad and horrible? In verses 25 through 27, John records that there are five people standing at the cross with Jesus before his death. We don't know if this was the total number, but it's who John records was present. So John is there. Anytime in the Gospel of John where it says the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's a reference to John himself as the author. Jesus' mother, Jesus' aunt, that's three, the Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. John varies from uh, the other Gospels in that he mentions also, he mentions these four women and himself being present before, before Jesus' death. It's very important, not just after his death. They were there before. So we know that there were not, they were not just mourners, That was part of their culture then, is that they had professional mourners um, to be there at the moment of someone's death or afterwards. But they were there before. So they were actually present. Now, there are many theories that can explain why this is a, that, that this is, why this particular crowd. But I want you to hone in on the fact that not only were they actually present for Jesus' suffering and humiliation, but they were still there. They remained present despite it all. Church, listen to this. One of the hardest things as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, will not only be to endure 
your own suffering, but to remain present with someone and endure when others are suffering. You see, my personality as such, and maybe you're the same, is that when someone is suffering, I just want to help. Like, you know, what can I do? Can I do something for you? What can I do? But the problem with that is that that's my comfort. That's, what I, that, that's my comfort zone. And often my doing something is, can be an escape to just being present with that person. Standing by someone in pain is, and not doing something can often be more powerful than doing something to ease their pain. Not always, but it's a powerful truth. Standing by someone in pain, not doing something, can be often more powerful than doing something to ease their pain. So maybe that person will have to endure pain, and in your ministry to that person, you can just be there with them and say, I'm not leaving, I'm here with you. I've had the same thing. Uh, with a dear brother of mine who's been going through a really hard time this week. And I have to remember, I'm not going to have all the answers for him. I'm not going to be able to say the right thing. I might not even be able to go and be with him presently because of the way my life is. But I'll call him. I'll text him. I'll listen to just be there with him. So at the start of my message, I said that my son... He asked me why Good Friday, which is coming up soon, hard to believe, it feels like we just ended Christmas and all of a sudden we're going into Easter. But he asked me, he says, why is it called Good Friday? And I said, that's because it's to remember Jesus' death. And my son said that it wasn't good because it was sad. You know, my son was right. It is the ultimate sadness. The creator of the universe, the author of all life, was killed in this terrible way, which we've talked about. And if you don't see that as sad, then you've missed it. But my nine-year-old son was speaking, actually, in our culture. He was just speaking from that place particularly our American culture, where we often believe that if it is sad, then it is not good. So my response to my son is, was, just because it's sad doesn't mean it wasn't good. I'll say it again. Just because it was sad doesn't mean it wasn't good. And much of our following Christ is embracing this truth that Christ came not to take away sadness, as some people believe, but he came and he said and he promised that he will wipe away every tear. Amen? But you may be saying, well, isn't that taking away sadness, right? No, It's wiping away every tear. The sadness may still be there, but his promise to us is that he will wipe away every tear. And this is what he did in the cross. The way of the cross is suffering. The way of the cross is humility. But it is always his sovereignty that binds his church together in that sadness, in that hurt, in that pain, because the cross brings hope. Church, they're t- these are tough times we're living in. And I hope you'll remember the truth about Good Friday as you come into it through Lent. That Jesus' death shows us that not all that is sad isn't good. Those hanging on the cross would often be alive um, um, and tortured for days. 
But Jesus didn't let others dictate the moment of his death. In, in verse 30, it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus declared it was finished. Not someone else. Jesus had the final say on death. Amen? So Jesus is the hero. He did defeat the enemy. He was the hero who was able to triumph over death and show the world that the way, the truth, and the life can never be conquered over death. Amen.